Hello. Happy to see everybody here today. Uh, I recognize that you have so many choices. And so I am just happy that the Lord brought you our way. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only, <clears throat> excuse me, are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And we have ventured out from our main scripture of John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which speaks of knowing the truth and being set free by that knowledge. We have put on pause our discussion of some truths that consist of freedoms that we enjoy as being part of the heavenly kingdom. And so for a physical description of where we are, I call it the scenic route. We are taking a fresh look at the love the Father has, not just for those who have accepted him, but the love he has for the whole world. Again, if you've missed any of our lessons, uh, you can go back at any time and catch up on our YouTube channel. That is Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis Incorporated, INC. So as we uh, make our way down to what I think is one of the most repeated and memorized scriptures of the Christian world, John 3.16, and as we take a fresh look at how great the Father's love is for all mankind, a question has been in the back of my mind, just begging to be asked for weeks now. I have been hushing it, uh, kind of like a parent hushes a child. Who, who, that child who just keeps trying to ask a question at the most inopportune time. But anyone who has dealt with a persistent child knows that they can't be hushed. They will be heard one way or the other. Such is the case for that question at the back of my mind. Each week, it has gotten closer to the forefront until finally, one day, without warning, it just burst out. Why a Pharisee? Why would Jesus choose a Pharisee to give the whole plan of salvation in a nutshell? A Pharisee. Why would God choose the most arrogant, self-centered, hypocritical of that era to receive a statement of fact that would impact the whole world? Why not choose one of his disciples, one of his followers, Peter, James, or John, who was always right there at hand? To me, and in my mind, John had to have been somewhere around to hear the conversation uh, in order to write about it since it's only recorded in the Gospel of John. Why would Jesus choose a Pharisee to receive such a profound and impactful word? It, 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 it is only given to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. This is the part of the scenic route where you see something so amazing that you stop the car, get out, and just ponder the view in total amazement. Why Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews? It has to be significant because John points it out. He could have just said a man came to Jesus one night. There are occasions in the Bible where a person is, is talked about, but we're not given a name. One such instance is Matthew, the 8th chapter, verse 1. 
It says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus, asking to be made clean. Jesus healed the man, but we're not told his name. But not so with Nicodemus. John is specific. There was a man. That man was a Pharisee. And that Pharisee name was Nicodemus. And he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. All that is specific stuff. Which brings me back to my question. Why a Pharisee? And not just any old Pharisee, but a man of standing. It, it couldn't have been because Jesus held them in such high regard. Remember last, just last week, I mentioned how Jesus compared them to a whitewashed tomb. Beautiful on the outside, but, not on, the in, but on the inside, full of dead men's bones. Y'all, that's not a compliment. John the Baptist called them, uh, them, along with the Sadducees, a brood of vipers. Again, that is not a compliment. But it did cause me to take a closer look at the Pharisees that interacted with Jesus. Matthew 5 and 20 says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now again, who was Nicodemus? He was a Pharisee, and he was a teacher of the law. And what was his concern? Entry into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. So, so, we can start our investigation with the question, what did their righteousness, the Pharisees, what did their righteousness consist of? First of all, they were always concerned about appearances. Jesus was concerned about the inside. He was concerned about the heart. That is why Jesus would go straight to the heart issue when engaged in conversation. The Pharisees and teachers of the law would follow Jesus around looking to see if he would break a law or, or one of their man-made rules. Rules that they used to measure how righteous a person was. Everything that they considered righteous was the exact opposite of what Jesus would do. Jesus called Matthew, who was a tax collector to be one of his disciples while he was on the job collecting taxes and cheating folk. I, I should point out that tax collectors were considered to be traitors because they worked for the Roman government and extorted money from their fellow Jews, making themselves rich. Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house with some of Matthew's friends tax collectors, and sinners. Those were his friends. Those were his BFFs because nobody else would be seen with them, with him or with them. Of course, the, the Pharisees were there looking to see what charges they could bring against Jesus. So they asked Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with such people? To them, that would put a red scar on his righteousness. Remember, they kept themselves pure by not associating with such people. Right about now, we can turn the mirror toward us and ask ourselves, who is it that we consider to be unclean? And, and we go out of our way to avoid being associated with them. Who are the people we don't want living next door to us? or even in our neighborhood. Of course, you know, we, we can put on our righteous hat and, and, and give them something, and, and either to be seen or to inwardly affirm our righteousness. You ever notice 
when folk decide to show how righteous they are. They leave their neighborhood and find one of the poorest ones to witness to or try to help. They, they, they leave their neighborhood and go find a, some poor folk to, to witness to or to try to help. And, and then they will take pictures. You know, we're in this social media age. They will take pictures and post it on social media. Stuff like hashtag, look at us, witnessing to these poor folk. The question that always comes to my mind is, can't you find unsaved folk in your own neighborhood? Have you tried next door? Have you tried across the street? Why do we assume that just because a person is poor, they're not saved? Appearances were most important to the Pharisees. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 5 through 7, speaking of the Pharisees, he says, everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seat in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. It, it, if it were not for the phylacteries, we could easily say this was written in the 21st century. But give it another look. Think about what it says. They make their phylacteries wide and tassels on their garments long. Why do they do this? To be seen of men. Phylacteries were leather boxes containing scripture that were worn by men during prayer time on the forehead or their own. The Pharisees and teachers of the law made theirs to be elaborate. Uh, it, it was an elaborate showpiece to look more righteous. Can you imagine this thing on the top of their head big? Uh, so the takeaway is that they are dressing to appear righteous. Think about pre- COVID days when we actually went to church. I'll step out on a limb and say that most of us spent more time physically dressing the body than preparing the heart for worship. Just like the Pharisees, we hold appearances in high esteem. We would rather everybody think we are okay than to actually be okay. We, we go through great lengths to appear as something other than what we are. It's like going for a family photo and, and the mother is the only one that actually wants to take the picture. She's determined that they will look like the happy family no matter what it takes. Everybody arrives at the studio mad, grumpy, with attitudes. And, but when it's time to smile, they put all their discontentment on hold and smile, knowing that that's the only way to leave sooner than later. The picture shows a happy family, but it's fake. It's just for appearances. You ever notice that the only pictures that are posted to social media are happy ones? The ones that Make our lives seem exciting and adventurous. Hashtag, look at me enjoying life. Nobody wants to see your real self and nobody wants to put their real self out there. You wouldn't dare put the real you out there. All open for the world to see. And if by chance you put a smidgen of the real you out there, it always has some caption to take away from the realness. It's interesting that Jesus starts his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew with the Beatitudes, where he turns the religious world upside down. Everything they held as gospel, Jesus says, not so. Listen what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, here's a good one, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Then in verse 20, our famous verse, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus at this time was on a mountainside sitting and teaching, thus the Sermon on the Mount. And he was teaching the people that had gathered. I would imagine that even on a mountain, it would have been so quiet when Jesus was teaching, saying the things that was turning everything upside down. It would have been so quiet that you could hear a pin drop even on the mountain. They had never heard or been taught such a thing. Then, toward the end of his ministry in Matthew, Jesus states the famous woes. Of course, they're too lengthy to read them all. So so I've picked out a few. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and there are verses 13 through 39, I've picked out some. He says, woe to you, and listen who he's talking to, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter, let those enter who are trying to. Verse 15, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. You know, leaving your neighborhood, going all the way over across town to the poorest neighborhood. He says, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Verse 23, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matter of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Verse 25, woe to you teachers of the law. And Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Verse 27, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell to hell? That's some powerful stuff. And with that, I'm glad I'm not like right in front of you. 
So I will end the lesson with the question that I began with. Why a Pharisee? Why a Pharisee? Come back next time as we continue to we continue with the question, why would Jesus give such an important world, change, an important world changing information to a Pharisee? Question to ponder. Well, loved ones, that's all I have for now. And until next time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And again, I love you and see you next time. Goodbye.